My name is Rumana, maiden name Ahmed, but now Rumana Chaudhry. Although I was born in Bangladesh, for the last 40 years and more, I've been living in Canada. I'm an author, poet, and columnist, and my upcoming book, Dusk in the Frog Pond and Other Stories, contains short stories in English, and it will be my 48th book. God bless me. I'm a bilingual writer also and author, and I've written poetry, novels, essays, columns in both the Bengali and English language. Bengali short stories happen to be my specialty, along with my poetry, and this is my first attempt at English short stories. I believe that I'm a strong, independent woman. Feminism is ingrained in me, but while writing these stories, I didn't focus on feminism as a theme. It just naturally became a part of my writing. Also, I guess due to my work, I work with the Immigration and Refugee Board and the Ministry of the Attorney General. And in the court hearings, I translate and uh, I interpret. And many stories of abused women have affected me greatly. And I would really like to do something and now I'll do a little reading from two of my short stories from the book Frog, uh, Dusk in the Frog Pond and other stories. The first story is titled Shadow Over the Henna Tree. Helen had no fight left. She sat on the stairs by the hallway, wondering about the state of her heart, trying to remember if she'd taken her medication that morning or the morning before. It was midnight when Angela walked in the door, red-eyed and wired. Now she stood there in her evening clothes, raging. Angela was Helen's youngest daughter and her most difficult. This was their third argument of the week. It was always something, a low grade, miss curfew, a moment of disrespect. Helen didn't want to fight, but she felt this need for her daughter to understand, to have compassion for the way her increasing disregard was affecting her mother. A few weeks prior, Helen had visited the doctor to inquire about antidepressant pills. She'd been losing energy, feeling hopeless, depleted. She couldn't help but blame her daughter to some degree. And so we each transgression her spite grew. Angela was standing in the hallway like a boxer, ready to pounce. Dad's absence doesn't make me your keeper, mom. I'm not looking for you to be my keeper. I'm looking for you to keep yourself safe. I am safe. And how do I know that when you are out so late? That's your problem, mom, not mine. You want me to be like that, like all your other friends from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, little perfect Pakistani and Bengali daughters, like the girls who stay home all day sweeping and doing their homework, who barely have any friends. Well, too bad. I'm not like that. And I am not going to be like them. I am like a Canadian girl, and I like it that way. It's not the end of the world. My heart hurts. My diabetes is acting up. Why do you need to aggravate my condition? Why do you have to care so much? Remember, mom, this world is not only about you. There are other people. Angela stumbled past her mother up the stairs and in typical teenage form slammed the door hard. My second story is titled Monsoon Breeze, and I'll be reading a part from that. Brishti shivered as the cold swept through her clothes intermittently, like a tidal wave. It was one of those gray to the bone days, had been like that for weeks. There was so much she wanted to do, and it seemed now that there was so little time in which to do it. It had been a specially hard day for her. 
Her feelings of humiliation and abasement from last night stung her more sharply than both Arlem's hands, as well as the harsh cutting words and winds of the brutal Toronto winter. However, it was on this day that Brishti had met Bob for the first time at a second cup at the end of a street. It had been a hard day with Alam abusing her physically. It was something about Bob's eyes at second cup, the warmth in them, the attentiveness that caught her attention, that held it. He came to her table, leaned in, unaggressive but confident. Would you mind if I asked you out to dinner tomorrow evening? He hadn't even asked her name, hadn't seemed to flinch at the ring on her finger. There was something so presumptuous about it, and yet so inviting. She admired his boldness, and it seemed both of them already knew the answer absolutely would be yes. They met the following day in an adjacent neighborhood at 8 p.m. for sushi. He arrived with dazzling yellow roses, and she took it as a sign. He held her gaze, touched her hand, dressed well, spoke well, made her want him almost against her will. He hugged her at the end of the meal, a tight, genuine embrace. And on the way home, she sang quietly to herself. Kothar to sheshne mon chai bole jai Amar moner kotha alponai There's no end to words. I feel like going on and on. My heart has so much to say. Thank you.